guys, man, wow, what a, what a wonderful beginning uh, to the worship service. If you would go and take your Bibles, turn in, turn on your Bibles to the book of Acts. We've been in Acts for the last um, few weeks. Um, man, the Lord's uh, really stirred my heart in a unique way right this minute, reminded me of a lot of things, and so uh, who knows what's going to happen in the next few minutes, but... It's my honor to be with you. Uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, it's not very important, trust me. But uh, I'm uh, one of the pastors of Upstate Church, and uh, I, I cannot tell you. If this is your first time, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but be, be very general because we don't have time. But God's been doing some super crazy stuff in the last 12 months through this church. And, um, and it's, it, you may say, well, I, I just attend a campus of of Upstate Church. I mean, God has done some crazy stuff in and through your church. Upstate Church, God is moving, man, and it's hard to explain um, other than the hand of God, the work of the Holy Spirit of God in and through uh, just a number of, of uh, people across the Upstate, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm just excited about what he's doing. And so I only get to be with you guys a couple times a year. Now, uh, because I really like your campus pastor, I'm here more often maybe. Uh, like at Christmas time, we come and, and worship with you guys. And then uh, at one of the few campuses I come to, and I don't preach sometimes, I just come to hear uh, Will because I genuinely mean this. Now, he is my son, so I really can't, uh, you know, say it. So I'm not a little biased, but, uh, but you get the opportunity. I'm jealous of you. You get to hear, in my opinion, uh, the best pastor we have, man, and uh, the best preacher we have on our team. And so I'm grateful to God for Will and his uh, faithfulness and all of you that serve. I mean, today we're in a circle with just tons of volunteers. Week in, week out, you're super faithful. And I'm just grateful for you guys. 30 years ago, now, for anybody to open with that means they're old, right? Because, you know, most of you in here wouldn't be able to say that. 30 years ago, I was not born, right? I mean, yeah. So 30 years ago, though, I was your age. Like, I just really started thinking about it. And I say your. I know we got a, a lot of uh, and families and, and some folks that are, are more, more old like me uh, as well uh, that are connecting. That's what we really want. We want to reach Anderson, right? We want to reach Anderson for Jesus. But a lot of you in here, um, I remember at 20 years old is when I met my wife which is crazy. You may say, what's spiritual about that? A whole lot, because I was so far away from God, man. And for a year after meeting her, by the grace of God, she stayed with me. And I was a dirt bag, man. And some of you can relate to that. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. And it, because, look, I, I was far away from God. I'd been raised in church. I'd, I'd come to Jesus when I was seven. But, uh, but man, between... For me, it was between like 15 and 21. For some of you, it may be like 18 to 22 or something like that or, or 23, 24. It's a season of like, I guess, finding yourself, seeking after a lot of stuff to fill the void that God alone can fill. And so God used Amy in, in a big way back then. But at 21 is really the best way to say it is that God wrecked me, man. He just totally in the middle of... Of, um, of a revival meeting, and I mean that like the when you used to go to old school like five-day meetings at night, and my dad had begged me. I was out of church. I wasn't going that often, and I was, I was living out of home now, and I was on my own. I I'd, I'd, I'd dropped out of uh, college, uh, and I went to college and majored in shooting pool in the game room, and uh, yeah, I was that guy, you know, and so mom and dad didn't want to pay for that anymore, so uh, I, I opened a business, which sounds weird, I know, but, but, uh, but I, I was doing a lot of things, including I was a security guard at a hospital, so I've just totally lowered your expectation of all security guards across America, right, because I was one. I was also the manager of a gold's gym, which then totally wrecks it, and was like, that's what happens? Oh, man, I'm staying away. From that, but uh, but so I was a, a, a security guard, and I told Dad that because my dad was a preacher, and he, he begged me. He was like, "Son, I don't know why. I, mean, I don't even know why I'm telling you the story. I didn't plan to." He said, "I don't know why, but I want you to come to church tonight, man. I just feel like God, God wants you to be there." And I have zero explanation for why I went, other than I love my dad. I didn't go because I felt God leading me there. I'm serious. I didn't want what God was given at that moment in my life, but I loved my dad. And I showed up, man, and I sat in that uh, old country church uh, for, for about an hour, and the preacher preached, and about halfway through his message, I have no idea what he was saying, because I was probably ignoring him, but, but an unexplainable 
conviction from God came over me. And I'm telling you, that's the, you talking about God of revival, pour it out. That night, he poured it out in my life. And I, I, I really can't even explain what happened except everything in my life changed. Everything. You may say, well, that sounds like salvation. Well, that really, I, I firmly believe I was saved at a young age, at seven years old. I'd given my heart and life to Jesus, and I lived for him for, for a good while until I got just distracted by a bunch of junk and started really believing a lot of lies and, and chasing a lot of things that weren't, weren't really godly. And, and so it, it was at that moment, though, that I, I, actually, I actually, for the first time in, in a long time, I believe I emptied myself of me, and, and I believe the Holy Spirit truly then filled me up. And I, from that moment on, it hasn't been perfect, trust me. Still fail the Lord, for sure. But, but I, I look back to that moment, and Amy can tell you, our lives changed. It was both, our lives changed, man. And it's been 30 years of life change. It, it wasn't just a moment. It was, it was hard. The first several years were really difficult to, to give up things and to, to, to surrender all areas of our lives. And, and, and there's still times where we fail. But here's, here's what I want you to do. If you really want revival, I mean, if you really want an awakening, it's, you know, again, all that, all the, the debate and conversation about different opinions about this or that. Here, here at the end of the day, when you just get rid of you, if you just empty yourself of you, that's when the Holy Spirit will fill you up. If you want to move of God, then get out of his way. If you want God to use you, then stop having to be the guy or the girl. You know, stop trying to plan out your life and make everything, you know, according to your will. And saying, hey God, would you put your stamp of approval on my stuff? Instead of that, if you'll just open up and say, God, whatever, man. I'm yours. Anywhere, any place, any time. I'm yours. I'm, 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 this is not some kind of eccentric emotional uh, effort to try to, to get you fired up. Here's what I'm telling you. A group of people this big in a town like Anderson that really, I'm talking about totally, I'm not even talking about worship services that get emotional. I'm talking about if you individually empty yourselves of you and be filled by the Spirit of God, you will wreck this town. This town will be turned upside down by the power of God. And that's what we're going to see in Acts 3 and 4. In Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, it's just some people who who honestly were following Jesus. I mean, they had not always got it right. Peter was a mess, right? I mean, if you know the Bible, Peter messed up a lot. I mean, he was the guy who cut people's ears off, right? And Jesus had to put it back on. That's, a, that's kind of crazy, right? Peter was always the one who said stuff too. He's hasty, said stuff too quickly and had to be corrected. He was the guy who said, I'll die with you, Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you're going to deny me three times. I mean, he's that guy, right? And so the story's kind of centered around Peter and John in Acts chapter 3. And it's going to help us kind of... I believe a plasm of all this that's going on, maybe even the stirring of our heart, maybe even the skepticism we might feel about other things. Because look, and no, no matter what, in a group this size, there's definitely different opinions about all kinds of things. But here's what I want you to hear. Everything that happened in the book of Acts in relationship to the power of God working through powerless people, the power of God working through powerless people, that can still happen today. And so don't, don't get confused and thinking, oh, everything that happened in Acts, oh, that was just, you know, right after Pentecost, a lot of crazy stuff going on. He's the same God, guys. Same God. And so when we read the, the, the story of Acts 3 and 4, we've got to remember that. Keep it in context. Now, we've already learned in past weeks that the power of the Holy Spirit is not an optional ideal but a personal imperative. If I'm going to live for God, if I'm going to serve God for the last 30 years, like truly, with total abandon and in, in great surrender, then I've got to recognize I can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. In my own power, I'm a failure. I'm absolutely inadequate. And I would not show up anywhere to hear me preach if it was in my own power. And so we have to believe that. If we don't believe that, then we need to pack our bags and go home. Because the fact of the matter is, without the Holy Spirit of God, we're here for the wrong reason. We discovered that our purpose, all of us, our purpose is that we're called to be witnesses. We're called to be witnesses. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And so whatever else God has led you to believe about your future, 
This is true of you if you are a follower of Jesus. He's called you to be a witness. Period. Period. All right? So there's no escaping that. He's called you to be witnesses of what he has done. So here's the thing. Followers of Jesus experience the power of the Holy Spirit themselves. And then they go and do what witnesses do. They testify to everyone they meet of what they have experienced. And so that's super simple. But that's, that's what the church is to do. Is to actually experience the power of God. And then testify to others of what the power has done in their lives. So... In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. And I know you heard it just a week or two ago. Now it says in verse 37, Now when they heard the message from Peter, this powerful message of the gospel, it says they were cut to the heart. And that's what I've been praying today. That God would cut us all to the heart. That he would wreck us. That he would absolutely mess up our plans and expectations. And that we would surrender our hearts. We'd empty ourselves of us. And what happened on that day in Acts chapter 2 would happen perhaps in our lives. The truth is conviction never comes without a hope of restoration. And that's the difference in uh, conviction and guilt. Right? You may hear a sermon and, and leave feeling guilty. Let me just say, if you leave feeling guilty after you hear a message from the Word of God, you're listening to the wrong spirit. Because the the spirit, the enemy, the spirit of wickedness and evil, he will constantly try to make you feel guilty. Make you feel like there is no hope of restoration. There, There is no way you'll ever find grace and forgiveness. But when the Holy Spirit of God convicts our hearts, we don't feel guilty. We're filled with hope of restoration. And so even in that moment, again, so many years ago, man, I, there was a million reasons I could tell you why I was least likely to succeed spiritually. There was nothing about me that you would have given a nickel for, all right? I'm telling you. But, but when he shows up in, in the darkest night, he will light it up. I believe that, man. I believe that there's nothing our God can't do. We're not just singing songs, man. We're talking about the testimony of what we've experienced in the power of God. I'm going to have to get down on the the floor and amen myself. All right, I'm about to get fired up. But repentance demands a response. This is the thing. So when we're convicted, when we are cut to the heart the way they were in Acts chapter 2, there's a hope of restoration, but there's a move to action. There's always a move to action. I think I stole that from Will. Repentance demands a response. And so there's been a lot of buzz, like Will said, about Asbury and and, and honestly, Lee College. And now I think uh, um, uh, the the college in in Birmingham, I can't remember. Uh, A lot of universities really seem to be experiencing a unique move of God. But I want you to hear me on this. You don't have to go to Kentucky to find revival. You don't have to go to Cleveland, Tennessee to experience an awakening and a move of God in your life. My prayer is that God will bring one in your life today. And maybe it'll be in the car on the way home. Maybe it will be as you're surrendering to him in devotion time in the morning. But listen, sincere confession and repentance will always be followed by life change and revival. It's always going to happen. Sincere confession and repentance is going to produce an awakening in your individual life. Now, here's what happens when we individually surrender to God. Uh, Man, the the young man I was praying with this morning earlier literally prayed this. And that is that, you know, really corporate revival is just a combination of collectively people coming together who have uniquely individually surrendered and experienced an awakening in their own lives. And so, really, we're not going to experience anything corporately that we've not been experiencing individually. And so we need to pray that, that God would forgive us, that we would repent. True revival will not necessarily lead people to liking you more, but it will lead them to lifting up the name of Jesus. So, so to today, I, I want to read portions of Acts 3 and 4, so you're going to need your Bible. Go and have it open and ready or on, and uh, let's look together. Uh, the whole idea in Acts 3 and 4 is that the that the apostles were, were speaking with boldness. The Christians, the church, had a holy boldness. And in verse 1 of Acts 3, it says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom, laid, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. 
Uh, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. What's that? He just want money. So he's asking for a donation. He was asking for money. And Peter directed his gaze at this man. This is so cool. He directed his gaze at him, as did John. And as they looked at him, they said to him, look at us. Before we read on, I want you to see something. They stopped long enough to see the man. I... I I know sometimes that the most powerful points God points out to me are the, are the most, like, duh moments. You know, as you're looking at it, you're like, no kidding. They, they looked at him, right? What's the big deal? How many times do you pass by people and you don't see them? You know, how many opportunities has God, like, divinely orchestrated in my heart and my life that I'm just, like, walking by and ignoring because I'm so distracted? Maybe I don't have time to actually lift my eyes up from this little device in my hand. I'm so, I'm so distracted by other things that I've prioritized above. God, would you work in my life? God, would you speak to me? God, would you give me opportunity after opportunity? And he's doing it. But we're so distracted, we don't even see the man. We don't even see the opportunities. And so it's not a lack of opportunity. Oftentimes, it's just a lack of awareness. Peter directed his gaze. He literally stopped walking, and he, he focused long enough to direct his gaze at this man, and John did as well, and they said, look at us. Now, I want to also think about it for just a moment. This is something we'd normally, when we read something or we might see somebody say, look at, look at us, it, it could even feel, especially in our cultural uh, not our particular church, but the, the church culture in America right now. And uh, the, the confusion of, of celebrity ministry and all of that junk. The fact of the matter is, oftentimes when we think of look at us in our context, we're, we may think, oh, they want, them to, they want to get the credit. Look what we're doing. Look what we can do. Look at us. But the context of the passage is actually right the opposite. Peter and John are asking this man to look at them for a different reason. They're saying, look... I want you to notice we are broke, <laughs> right? I mean, that's literally, they're, they're, look at us. We ain't got no silver and gold, right? That's what they basically say. We don't have what you're asking for. We don't have, the, do you see the clothes we're wearing? You know, we're, we're not capable of, of giving you what you're asking for. Look at verse 5. And this man fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive some money, something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I'm going to give it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand, and he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now later in verse 12, we see that Peter gets kind of aggressive because people seem a little bit surprised, but they, they're doing, again, what we would expect we would want people to do in our flesh. They're coming to Peter and John. They're, ask, they're acting like Peter and John are something great, man. So they start making celebrities in their own mind out of Peter and John. And so what does Peter do? Peter gets aggressive back at them in verse 12 and basically says, why are you guys so surprised? Why are you so shocked that God would do this? Let me just let you know, it's not by my power this is happening. So he clarifies, and this is so important. He wasn't trying to direct attention to him. He was trying to direct attention to Jesus Christ. So we learn a lot from the passage we've read and, and the passage that follows that we'll read again even through verse uh, chapter 4. But what's clear from the beginning is that these apostles were bold. I'm going to say it like this because I want it to be an application the entire way through for me. They were bold, more bold than me and you. I think they had a boldness that, that we do not display very often. They were bold, man. They, were, they didn't care who disagreed with them about the gospel. It didn't matter how unpopular it was that they were going to speak the truth they were going to be faithful to the call of the gospel. And so it's, a, it's a, a, a question that comes to our mind is, what made them bold? And that's a really good question. I mean, it's a good question because this is the same Peter that was afraid. This is the same guy who was unwilling to say, yes, I know Jesus, when he was standing in a courtyard with a few people. But remember, just days later, was standing in front of thousands on the day of Pentecost, boldly proclaiming the gospel. 
What changed? Literally, the easiest answer is the Holy Spirit. I mean, he, he totally wrecked him and took over his life. So that the things and the priorities and the way he made decisions and what he was going to do when he was going to do it, all of that was changed when the power of the Holy Spirit came on him. Now, here's what we can deduce from that. If we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, but we're filled with ourselves, because even when you're born again, you can, you can neglect the filling of the Spirit of God by sanctification and basically allow your life to become filled with less important things. That's what had happened to me. I'd become distracted and empty spiritually. And look, you could go to church every Sunday. You may come here every Sunday, man. You may lift your hands during songs and you know you're running on E right now. You're in the red, bro, and your tank is empty. And we're, we can fool each other. We're really good at it. We're, we're really good at playing church and acting like everything's okay. But before God, I don't know who it is, but before God, you and God knows how full your tank is. And so here's the thing. In the middle of this, this is what changes everything. Is the filling of the Holy Spirit in Peter's life is what gave him the boldness. The apostles were, were bold. They had a holy boldness that they had never had before. And the difference is, even though the disciples had been those who were hiding while Jesus was hanging, now we see Peter bold in his declaration of the truth. So I'm going to give you reasons why they were bold real quickly. First, here's the, the, probably the longest one. They truly valued the gospel. You could even say it like this. They really believed what they, what they followed. I mean, the filling of the Holy Spirit gave them confidence and boldness to follow what they believed in complete surrender and sincerity. So it wasn't just lip service. It wasn't just like going to church, you know? And in North American Christianity, that's why it's, so, it's gotten so terrible, is that we have, we've minimized being a follower of Jesus to going to small groups and an hour of worship on Sunday morning. And if you're going to church, in, our, in most people's context or estimation, you're a good Christian. I mean, that, that's not a biblical view of total surrender, right? And so we, we literally, we have to recognize they, they valued the gospel in a way that is uncommon in our day. This culture is so confused about what the gospel actually is. Let's take it a step further. I believe the church today in our country is confused about what is the gospel. Some people consider uh, the value of the gospel to be the equivalent of a self Self-help seminar. Others seek self-centered gospel that makes Jesus a genie in a bottle. Still more are looking for a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel so that if they give this or pray hard enough or believe enough that God will do anything that they say. Others think the gospel is fluid and we can adjust the substance to the culture. And let me just say clearly, look, to make sure nobody confuses what I'm saying... Is the gospel for all cultures? 100%. I mean, the, the gospel is applicable. It's, it, it is relevant. We don't have to make it relevant. The gospel is relevant to our lives in every culture. But the culture does not shape the gospel, right? The culture doesn't change the gospel. Um, and, and the gospel doesn't have to be manipulated or watered down in order for it to... To be powerful, even saying it sounds ludicrous, right? You don't want to water down the gospel to make it powerful in a culture. That's crazy. We, we lose the, the potency of the gospel when we weaken it by our, our lack of faith and boldness in its power. And so with all of that, look, how, how do I know I truly value the gospel like Peter and John did here in Acts chapter 3? When someone's confused about what they want the gospel to be, do we avoid them? When somebody doesn't really know what the gospel is, do we, do we criticize them? What's our first move? Do we confront them? Do we affirm them? Based on context and outcome, we know Peter and John gave this man true gospel. Now, if you just read it without looking at the whole picture, it looks like they just gave the guy healing. And they, but, but the fact that they even did so in the name of Jesus Christ, and we read even the context of the sermon that Peter preaches literally after this in the remaining of chapter 3, we understand that Peter and John gave the true gospel, the complete gospel. 
And this is what we need to understand. Love is not giving people what they ask for, but what they need most. If you really love your coworker at your job, if you really love your children, if you really love your classmate, man, don't, don't think you need to give them what they want, what they ask for. But you need to give them what they need most. And that is the true, undulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so let me ask you this. What do you consider to be the greatest value in life? And I don't want you to give me Sunday school answers. I just want you to think in your own heart and life and, and estimate, like do an evaluation of your own heart right now. What do you think people need most in this world? It's not a difficult question, but I want you to think, what do, what do you hope for most in this world? Let me rephrase it. What do you spend most of your time thinking about? What do you spend most of your time hoping happens? What do you spend most of your time wishing was a reality? And again, you guys may be super spiritual, much more right with Jesus than I am sometimes. But I want you to know, most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, Jesus and awakening in, in, in our generation is not the answer that comes to our mind. Because our, we're so distracted, man. We're so, we're so messed up by the, the whispers of the enemy and the lies of this culture. And, and honestly, most of the time we're missing the mark and we're walking by the opportunities that God has for us. And so we've got to really be confronted with this. Look, what, what are you seeking most in your life? Wealth, fame, popularity, comfort, relationships, family, affirmation, acceptance. Our foundation, our missional passion, and our motivation must be gospel above everything else. The value of the gospel was evident in Peter and John's message. How do we know this? Because look what happens next. In chapter 4, I want you to notice first how a random connection with this dude at a gate. That's all we're talking about, right? He's passing by a gate and the guy's asking for money. This random connection with a man at a gate led to an audience with people who needed the gospel. And I think we miss that. See, we, miss, we may minimize the, 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 the connection we miss because we're distracted. But when we miss the man at the gate, we never have the opportunity to speak before the rulers and the scribes. See, if they had missed the opportunity with the man, they would have never had the audience with people who needed it even more. Look at verse 5 of chapter 4. Acts 4, 5 says, On the next day, their rulers and the elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with, uh, with Annas and the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were uh, of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name do you do this? Why are you just going around healing people, man? Then Peter, what's it saying in verse 8? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit said, Rulers of the people and elders, we are very sorry we have offended you. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. Rulers and people, the elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, by the way, <laughs> non-confrontational, right? Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you, this Jesus Basically, this same Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So it's obvious in this passage, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Peter and John recognized the value of the gospel. They knew that without the gospel, without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, they had nothing worth sharing. And without the resurrected Christ, Peter was nothing but a fearful man who was not even willing to admit he was a follower of Jesus around a campfire with 20 people. But when he had met the resurrected Christ and been filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was bold enough to share it no matter the cost. So we see that first 
they truly valued the gospel. But then second, I want you to see, they had been with Jesus. So how, how do you know? I mean, how do you, how do you really know somebody is, is having, I guess, spiritual boldness? Or, 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 or I guess you could say, what does true spiritual boldness produce? Or what causes it? That's a better question. Um, man, they had been with Jesus. It's not they just showed up and were representing a, a church or a campus or, or a religion. They, they had been spending time with Jesus. Um, you and I both met people who, within minutes, confirmed their passion for Jesus. And they're just contagious when we're around them. It, it, it makes us maybe uncomfortable, <laughs> but, it, but it, it rubs off on us. And, and that's, that's who we're talking about here. Many Christians seem to live in, in neutral territory to where they can be comfortable and actually other people can be comfortable completely around them, but in a bad way. I don't think you should repel lost people. Please don't hear that. But I, I, do, I do believe that sometimes... People can't tell we've been with Jesus. You know, people can't tell that we walk with Jesus. But listen, you, you can't hide it when you are full of something. <laughs> you take that and apply it however you want to, but you can't. You can't hide it when you're full of something. Acts 4.13, look what it said. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, here's what they said. And they perceived that they were uneducated. These guys were foolish guys. They were uneducated, ignorant guys. Common men. These, these weren't superstars. They were uneducated common men. They were astonished. Why? They recognized they had been with Jesus. They recognized that, that they had spent time with the resurrected Jesus. So, so nothing fuels boldness or you should say bold witness, like being with the Lord Jesus. If you want really an awakening, if you really hunger for that, which I mean, I know that's maybe a little presumptuous. I don't think everybody in here may not even be saying that. I hope and pray that all of us would say that. But look, if you really want awakening and revival, it's not going to happen if you don't spend time with Jesus. It's not. I mean, you come to worship service, you can lift change, you do whatever, anything else, man. If you think that's like putting diesel in your gasoline car, okay? It's not that it's not fuel, but it's not going to start your fire, buddy, all right? Spending time, thank you. One person thought that was funny. I, the rest of y'all need to wake up, all right? But, but spending time with Jesus is going to fill your tank, you know? Praying the Holy Spirit of God will fill you up. That's what's going to make a difference with people you pass. That's what's going to help you actually see them and stop long enough to connect them with Jesus. And that's what's going to open up other doors to larger groups of people who need Jesus just the same. I get up every morning. One of my duties as Amy's husband is to get the coffee every morning. She gets up before me like 15 minutes, and she literally says two words, coffee time, all right? It's like 15 minutes after she gets up, Coffee time. That's my alarm clock every day. All right. It's absolute truth. She'll tell you. And so it usually, I hit the snooze and she says it again five minutes later. Coffee time. A little louder, you know. But needless to say, I have to walk down the stairs, which is getting harder the older I get, and, uh, and get the coffee. I brew both of her cups and I walk back up. You're like, why are you telling this? Because sometimes the Keurig's a little weird. Sometimes it's like a low cup, and I don't know why, but then other times it's like really full. It's, uh, we have a, a, a messed up coffee maker. And so when, we're going, when I'm going up the stairs, if I put too much cream or two, that may be part of it, um, the, the coffee's like really close to the top. You ever done that? And, um, and, and so it, maybe it wasn't coffee, but whatever you're drinking. And so uh, going upstairs with two coffee cups that are filled to the brim is not a good idea, all right? Because it just gets a little shaky. And here's what I learned. If it's, if it's filled to the top, I'm going to spill it every time. Now, sometimes I wipe it up. Other times I just kind of take my shoe and do it like <laughs> this. Don't tell Amy. But anyway, you know, I, I, so what's that mean about we spill what we're filled with. That is totally true. Spiritual application for us is that when I am empty of the Spirit, there is no chance I'm spilling Him anywhere. There's no chance that you're going you're gonna to sense His presence in my life. There's no way that the power of God is going to be realized in anything that, 
that I do in front of you. Why is that? Because I'm not filled with the Spirit of God. We spill what we're filled with. And so here's the question for you. What are you spilling? Because I believe you're sub- all of us are spilling something. It may be that you're spilling conversations about, you know, your favorite sports team or whatever. I'm, I'm good or bad about that, depending on how you look at it, right? Because I love talking about the Braves. Um, I'm an Alabama fan too, but that's a little embarrassing right now. Um, but, but, you know, we, we spill what we're filled with. You know, if it, maybe it's a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever, but all, all I'm challenging you to do is, like, check yourself. What are you filled with? You know, what, what matters most to you? Like, really, not like Sunday school answer. I'm talking about, like, really, what, what is it that you're filled with because you spill what you're filled with? And So after, after all of this happened, the council got together and said, what are we going to do with these crazy guys, Peter and John? They're obviously... Nuts, they're uneducated, but the people really like what they're doing. And they basically said it's obvious that they've worked a miracle. So I don't, I don't, what are we going to do with this guy? Look at verse 18 in chapter 4, Acts 4, 18. So they called them and charged them to stop speaking or teaching at all in the name of Jesus. <laughs> so this is so funny, man, because Peter's a test again. He's been bold up to this point. But how's he going to pass this test? These are the lawgivers, right? These are the people who are like laying down the law literally to them. In verse 19, Peter and John answered these guys and said, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So listen. From an application perspective, here's the question. Have you seen and heard God move? All right. Have you seen and heard God move in your own individual lives? If if so, God has called you, Acts 1-8, to be a witness of what you have seen and heard. You have experienced the Holy Spirit. You have witnessed the resurrected Christ. If you have been with him, go tell people what you have seen and heard. That's all Peter's saying. Peter said, I can't keep it inside, man. I cannot do anything but spill what I'm filled with. And I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that was, that's such a a simple yet profound truth. And so finally, here's here's the third thing real quickly. Or I'll I'll keep going. They truly valued the gospel. Secondly, they they had been with Jesus. There was no mistaking it. But, But third, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I've kind of been preaching that point the whole 30 minutes, all right? But listen, the spiritual balance of power is really unexplainable. I listened to Pastor Chuck, Dr. Chuck Fuller. Isn't he great, by the way? I uh, listened to him. He's preaching downtown today. I listened to him at 845, driving down the interstate. And um, I, I'm not quoting him because I got it wrong, I'm sure. But I'm paraphrasing something he said. The spiritual balance of power is unexplainable. Even the powerful who come against Christ are rendered powerless. But the powerless who surrender to Christ are given transformative power. That's just a simple, but so good to know that's the difference the Holy Spirit makes. Look at verse 31, Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were filled. It's not just Peter anymore. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I I think that anytime we see the word together, it jumps out at me. And the book of Acts has it a lot of times. And I think it emphasizes the unity of the body of Christ. And look, I I know, again, some of you have been a part of Upstate Church Anderson for a long time, maybe since the beginning, over a year ago. And and, uh, some of you may be brand new, but look, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're part of the body of Christ. If you're not a a believer, if, if you've never really surrendered your heart and life to Jesus, this is the day, man, this is the day that you should do that. 
But today, if you're, if you're following the Lord, and you, you may be following him at a one or a two on a scale of one to ten before, maybe you're like I was when I was 21, 20, and you're just kind of aimless and wandering a little bit, confused, distracted maybe is a good word of where I was again. And, and you may say, man, I, I just don't, I don't know, I don't know where to start. I think you've started by being here because this is the community. They were together. And the place was shaken as they prayed. Now, again, you may say, well, I don't know if it's physically going to shake today. And <laughs> I'm with you. But, but I hope and pray that we are shaken. I hope that God shakes you. I hope that God does for you because he really did it for me. It'd be easy for me to say he did it to me, but that would not be entirely accurate. He, he did it for me. I was, I was wandering, man. I was aimless. I was, I was purposeless. And he shook me. He wrecked me. And my life has never been the same. I believe my children. Listen, I want you to hear this. I know you're like, maybe you're like so far from kids right now. My children are who they are today. Because of what God did for me that day. My children's children, I believe, will be what they will be because of what God did for me that day. He took everything from me. <laughs> you may say, well, that sounds really bad. No, because everything I had was worthless. My hands were full, man. My hands were full, and I was carrying so much more than I was able to carry. He took everything from me. And he replaced it with hope, with restoration, with peace and purpose, and love and grace and passion that even now, all these years later, still fuels my fire. You may say, man, I'm a long way from 50, bro. Let me just say, you, you know, you're not a long way from revival. It's close. Awakening in your life. It's not a magic equation. It's not a geographical address in Kentucky. It's not a special song that gets everybody fired up or stirred up. Awakening is not something that has to be worked up. I really believe revival is not limited to a physical place, but it is limited to a surrendered heart. So today I pray that you would give him everything. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for what you did for me years ago. God, I've never, never been the same. And I want it for everybody in this room. Lord, you changed me. You gave me hope and a purpose. God, you called me to preach a year later. So crazy. If it weren't for that day, if it weren't for that voice, if it weren't for that moment of surrender, God, I have no idea where we would be. But grace. God, you are so good. Speak to us. I, I pray you just take control. I don't. I don't want to manipulate or do anything that would uh, twist anybody's arms. We pray as we sing this song, God, you would speak to our heart and we would, maybe for the first time in our life, <laughs> just be obedient. Not allow the distractions to get in the way, not allow anything we would do or decide to grieve your spirit, but God, that we would just be without question 100% totally surrendered to you and the filling of your spirit. God, we pray it in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me?